Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're just going to get started in a minute. Um, just give it uh, another 30 seconds for everyone to join the uh, webinar. While we're um, while we're getting started, I'll uh, share the disclaimer, which is um, uh, important. Our compliance departments always like us to uh, share these informations. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for the uh, year-end uh, crypto webinar. Um, we wanted to um, take a minute to to really step back and and reflect on the year that's sort of passed, but more importantly, talk a little bit about um, uh, you know so the evolution of the space in in crypto, what's been happening, uh, and where we're going over the next uh, number of years um, as we enter twenty twenty four specifically. We've had a pretty um, exciting year in terms of 2023, um, and you know we thought it would be important to kind of share some thoughts on what's occurred, um, how we've gotten here, and more importantly, what sort of the the different factors that are driving the markets. Uh, you know, not only through this year, but as we enter into the the year ahead. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of noise, uh, and a lot of um, details, and you know that are sort of popping up and and different pieces of information. And it's important. To have a really clear understanding of of the details, um, today we're going to be joined. So uh, first off, my name is Sam Safe. I'm founder and CEO of Purpose, um, and you know, really proud and excited to to share uh, a lot of content today. Today we're going to be joined with uh, Tyler and Cameron Winklewass. Uh, uh, Cameron and Tyler are actually uh, key partners of ours uh, on the custody side of the business. Uh, they are co-founders of a company called Gemini, which is a global crypto and Web three platform. Um, that offers a wide range of crypto products and services for individuals and institutions uh, across and around the world. Um, they are one of our core custodians for our crypto ETFs at Purpose uh, and have had a really strong uh, and long-term uh, working relationship with the, uh, with the, with the organization. Um, the Winklevoss brothers also are principals of Winklevoss Capital, uh, which is a private investment firm that focuses on investing in early stage technology startups. Um, and they've been angel investors and entrepreneurs in emerging technologies, uh, really for the last 20 years. Um, and they uh, were well known as early investors and um, uh, advocates for Bitcoin uh, and uh, and launched Gemini in 2015 as uh, an infrastructure and institutional platform uh, for the space, as they recognized the need for uh, institutionalization for the back end and the infrastructure to support uh, the industry as it evolved. Um, and then prior to um, uh, starting uh, the, the business, um, actually Cameron and Tyler uh, were both members of the U.S. men's national rowing team. Uh, they have both graduated from Harvard, Harvard University uh, and uh, also have their MBA uh, from the Said uh, Business School from Oxford University. Um, and they've represented the United States at the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing uh, in China, and they're placing sixth in the men's pair event. So we're glad to have uh, Tyler and Cameron on uh, on with me today. They're going to be joining shortly as uh, as we go through um, uh, the discussion today. Uh, you know, we're going to have uh, a good opportunity to kind of leverage their knowledge and intelligence and in what's going on. As we sort of uh, as we you know kind of get started here, I wanted to maybe give you a little bit of perspective um, first and foremost on what's been going on. And um, so you know, first uh, you know purpose. We've been in the space for a number of years. Um, you know, both for for two two important principles. So today we are the largest ETF uh, manufacturer of uh, crypto products in the world. Um, we're very proud of the uh, products that we've built over the last number of years and the legitimacy of what they've done, both in our BTCC, which is our Bitcoin ETF, and our uh, ETHH, which is our Ether ETF, and then of course the uh, yield versions of those BTCY and ETHY, um, which to combined represent over two and a half billion in in, in capital. Um, but what one of the things that's really important is that we have sort of two components of the conversation. The first is, you know, we launched these products, um, you know, because uh, we felt that the market needed a safe, secure, uh, and uh, uh, low agency way for individuals to participate in the crypto ecosystem and and to get access to uh, crypto in a really unique way. And the second is we also had a deep thesis. Um, you know, we had a deep thesis on the space, and we've had one for a long time, and we felt that it was really important. Uh, to uh, uh, to to uh, allow investors who had a thesis in the space to 
have a uh, have an easy way to articulate that. And so, you know, as we talk today, we're going to talk a little bit about both of those components. So the importance of the infrastructure, the importance of access, the importance of um, call it low agency. And and uh, and what I mean by low, low agency is um, low friction ways to own the asset and then also security and safety, which is a really important component. And then we'll also spend a lot of time on, you know, the the the, the th sort of thesis to the asset. Why why is uh, crypto, uh, why is Bitcoin, why is Ethereum, why is the space exciting? Um, and, you know, what I encourage every single one of you to do is if you haven't already, is to take the time to pay attention and build your own thesis. Uh, whether you are a uh, an individual who understands the value, that understands the technology, understands what these can ultimately represent, or uh, are curious, it's really important that you develop your own perspective on what it is that uh, is represented here and why crypto is either exciting or not exciting. Um, and many people, of course, around uh, you know society have their own opinions. Uh, a lot of people like to vocalize those publicly. Our view has always been, and my view has always been, if you're going to vocalize things, you should you know really get into the depth and understand it, so you have a deep understanding of why uh, these assets are are relevant or not. Um, so you know, I think I saw uh, Tyler uh, join a second ago, um, and I think they're going to join uh, when when they are uh, on, and and we'll get them involved. So first and foremost, on on sort of the review, uh, year interview, and and if, if Tyler or Cameron are on, please just uh, uh, sh uh, jump on whenever you are, and we'll get you involved as soon as we get going. Um, year in review. I think it's important to sort of look back at the, the last year, um, of course, the last couple of years, uh, and, and look at what's gone on within crypto. And I think I always like to look at a bigger perspective. So, you know, crypto is a, uh, is a space that really, um, it, you know, is still early and young. It was developed in the sort of coming out of the financial crisis, as everyone knows, uh, 2008, 2009, as a idea um, to really decentralize um, the way that um, value is transacted between one party and another party. Um, as you know, what we call that is the agency between uh, transactions. And so, you know, most of um, or all of society today generally is uh, transacted within high agency, meaning that there's usually a broker or somebody in between two parties when they want to transact. And, and crypto um, and Bitcoin specifically was built on this principle of what if we could develop a trust, a trust um, uh, structure that ultimately did not require you to build um, agency between two parties. And, um, uh, you know, so that ultimately party A and party B could transact directly uh, and do that in a very high trust way. And so that was the principles behind it. And of course, it sort of created this whole uh, unique um, and exciting uh, vision for the future of, 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 call it, general value exchange. Um, and, you know, we've seen this amazing kind of uh, breakout of, of crypto as a principle. And what's happened in, in the last sort of 15 years since the original um, white paper on Bitcoin has been that, you know, many people have started to look at it and build their own, call it innovations, uh, in their own ideations of what this ultimately could be. But the foundations are really important to understand. And so, you know, first and foremost, it's a young space. It is still developing. It's still uh, figuring out its footing. It's still figuring out what it ultimately could be. But the foundations of why it's relevant are very, very real. Um, and as you think about the next 10, 20, 100 years of society, and you think about the way that technology is evolving, both from the internet uh, to AI, um, you start to think about how this technology, the blockchain and tokenization technology will become extremely relevant to enable transaction value to, uh, to occur in a, uh, in a high trust uh, or low trust environment. Um, so, you know, when you think about that, it's really important. And so, so when you sort of take that from the sort of how this space has evolved, it's no question that we've seen a lot of volatility. We've seen a lot of uh, development and with development, any new sort of new era, you see a lot of um, uh, players that come that may be less scrupulous, uh, less beneficial use cases, all those things that occur in any uh, uh, sort of new technology. And I think it's really important to uh, recognize that. So, why that? Why I say that is, as you think about the space and you see all the noise that's going on around us, you have to be able to cut through the noise and really focus on what's at the heart of it. And of course, you know, at the heart of it, we've seen a really exciting foundational principle of technology and value principle that continues to evolve on a global scale. Um, 
And you know, what, one of the things that of course uh, is important is this is an asset that gets priced every single day. So you have a unique technology with lots of noise and you have pricing every single day. So what does that cause? It causes a lot of sentiment, uh, both positive and negative that you see in the daily prices and you see a lot of um, uh, impact on that. So of course, 2023, 2022, 2021 were years where you saw lots of sentiment. One of the things that I care deeply about is, you know, as you think about the sentiment, sentiment comes and goes. Um, and it goes, you know, there's times when people are extremely excited about the space. There's times that the space is actually out of favor. But what's happening at the core? What's happening at the foundation? And that's what we really care about. So 2023, when we look back, we saw a lot of really uh, continued foundational principles that are evolving in the space. So the core back, you know, uh, utilization of the technology, the, the value proposition of the technology beyond the sentiment has actually been growing. So first off, Tyler, I want to just uh, thank you for joining. Welcome uh, and appreciate uh, you being on. Um, I've given an introduction already um, of you and your brother as well. So uh, appreciate um, uh, you trying to make it here. We're just kicking off. I'm, I'm, you know, really going through the uh, uh, 2023 in review, and so um, I'd love you to pipe in as I go along, and and you know, add some color, and I'll ask you some questions as we go along. So, so first off, you know, we've had a really positive 2023, both on the sentiment side and the market price, um, and that's coming off of a very difficult 2022. Um, but that's sort of what we've seen in the space. If you actually flip, um, you know, Mark, if you can share the slide that shows sort of historical prices, this is a really interesting thing. So, you know, sorry, previous slide. Um, this is the sort of looking annual returns of asset categories. And you can see here, uh, the returns of Bitcoin have been pretty spectacular in certain years. And then of course, pretty disastrous in other years. So if you look at the returns of, you know, 2022 uh, and 2018, you know, you'd think that Bitcoin was an awful asset, but if you look at it in the compounding effect of what's gone on, you know, through the two, you know, mid 2010s, uh, and of course, in the last uh, year, uh, and through the 2019 to 2021 period, Bitcoin has been an asset that continues to see significant value appreciation. And what that is, is that a new technology, new area, sentiment increasing, but foundational sentiment also increasing. So yes, you have the market, call it frothiness sentiment, but you also have this foundational sentiment that is driving into the asset as people become more aware of it, become more, um, build their own theses, and, and more importantly, also start to build an understanding of you know why they like it and also the the access points become um, uh, less friction, and so that's a really important thing. And so 2023 has been a big year, of course, over 100% returns in crypto broadly. Bitcoin, um, uh, you know, and Ethereum have been you know seen really strong returns. Ether just under 90%. Bitcoin just over 120%. And you know what we've also seen is that the more core areas of the space. So the, the sort of more higher quality crypto assets have been the areas that you've seen greater appreciation. That's the really important difference because in some of these different periods, we've seen crypto that was less legitimate actually providing uh, uh, greater returns. And that creates a lot of, call it sentiment uh, changes as well and disastrous outcomes for some investors. On top of that, it's also, we saw some really important regulatory changes. So um, 2023, we saw positive regulatory advancement. And, and for many people in a, in a decentralized asset, you'd say regulation's bad. But in fact, regulation actually is really important. And, and it's important because what it does is it builds um, the foundations of infrastructure um, and call it oversight that are critical to any asset category. And so, of course, in the United States, we saw... Um, a little bit more clarity, uh, not not, and I know Tyler will probably have a lot more depth on this one. Uh, you know, a lot, a little more clarity on um, you know what's going on and how they're going to look at crypto, and and I think it's sort of built through the year, especially some of the different actors and players uh, pushing the uh, the regulators to to create clarity. Um, but more importantly, we also saw um, settlements around um, really important cases. So the FTX case resolution uh, or coming, uh, you know, sort of movement towards a resolution is really critical. Binance, um, the settlement on that was a really critical step in the industry because what it allows for is as you sort of see these sort of changes, the regulators can now start to legitimize the asset when you have uh, the overhang of historical cases kind of coming to bear. In Europe, we saw, you know, um, the EU lawmakers passed a vote to um, uh, implement sort of a regulation around what they call the markets and crypto asset regulation, which sort of states that crypto exchanges and custodial wallets um, have to be licensed. Uh, and that token issuers must uh, you know, follow a certain set of, call it requirements, and um, for their white papers, for their transparency, for the reserves. And by the way, this is a really good thing. 
And so legitimization through regulation is a really good thing for advancing an industry. I'll stop here and I'll actually, I wouldn't mind Tyler's perspective on this because I mean, you're probably deeply involved in this. And Tyler, you know, how have you seen coming in the United States specifically, some of the changes in from a regulatory clarity perspective? Um, and I know it's probably started with a very frustrating part of the year and as you sort of entered the end of the year. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for having me, Sam. And um, great sort of uh, lay up into this this question. Um, you know, there's, it, it feels like we're, we're getting to more regulatory uh, clarity in the U.S. in terms of Bitcoin. I think that everyone unanimously believes that Bitcoin is a commodity, um, including the SEC. So that's that's nice. But there is still some murkiness on other other assets that are being adjudicated in the courts. So the Ripple case for the, versus the SEC, and unfortunately, without um, great rulemaking. It just takes time to get to that clarity. But as you said, there's across the globe, Europe's making great strides towards more, more clarity in other jurisdictions. So it's it's happening. It's just going to take some time. Um, but ultimately, you know, our thesis the whole time has been that thoughtful regulation uh, breeds the best innovation and in consumer protection. And so the healthiest markets strike that balance, that tension between the right amount of regulation, not too much, but not too litter, li little, that, that really fosters um, an explosion of great growth and innovation, but also the right protections for consumers. So we've been strong advocates for this for, for close to, to a decade, and it's great to see that happening um, over time. Yeah, and I think we, we, um, we agree with that. And Tyler, I mean, in Canada, one of the lucky things we've had is We've had a regulator that has understood um, how to sort of tread cautiously, um, you know, do the right type of analysis, but but more importantly, also recognizes two things. One, it is on their job to work with the industry to understand the space, to um, to understand the details and get really educated on the infrastructure and the platforms and the and the ways that this could go well or not go well. But then the second thing is also um, to recognize that individuals are ultimately going to find ways, especially in an asset like this, that is so global in nature has, um, uh, you know, that, that it's kind of non-jurisdictional in many ways, um, can, that, that they will find ways to ultimately go if they want to into the space. And that recognizing that a regulated way to do so is better for society than an unregulated way. Uh, have basically chosen to be on the side of innovation and to help innovation be, um, you know, structurally under the regulatory frameworks. And I think that's been really positive. As, as you know, you know, you've been a partner with us from day one on the launch of our ETFs in Canada. But, you know, Canada has been willing to have those conversations because you could sit down with a regulator to walk them through the changes on what you could do to create safeguards around the industry, you know, custody being one of the most important ones there. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the U.S., uh, it's it's been frustrating because it seems like uh, the regular it seems like there's this notion that crypto is bad and therefore we should do everything we can to ban not allow it. Yet, of course, um, there's a lot of uh, underlying, you know, things like the exchanges and such. And you could always go and buy it. So so the idea that, um, you know, people could go offshore or onshore is one thing, but but it seems a little bit sort of two-faced or two double-sided to sort of have this one side of you can do it but you can't do it yeah and 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 the 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 problem with draconian regulation or or walls around crypto is that it creates distortions and it pushes uh investors and consumers into the arms of players like ftx so I, you're right that people people are like if they sense an opportunity if they sense the future they're going to find it. And it's non-jurisdictional. And everyone's got an internet connection for the most part. So they will find their way to, to get crypto if, if they want it. And so it's better to do it in a thoughtfully regulated way and venues onshore, as opposed to pushing people offshore to this race to the bottom, to these venues that have no controls, no security, and can do really bad stuff like we saw with with FTX. And so, um, 
you know, I think that the the idea that you you're going to stop it completely is it creates these these distortions and really sets up investors. And and in the end of the day, what are they protecting investors from? Like making adult decisions and buying Bitcoin for the last decade, which was the best performing asset or one of them, um, the last decade and and is proving to be the same this decade. And so um, the heavy handedness has created all of these problems. Um, and so I completely agree with you. And the the regulars in Canada, we've had great dialogue with them. We're doing, we're complying and we're, we're applying for license and going through all of those uh, important approvals. And I agree, they've been very open. We're very encouraged with that dialogue and, and, and that's great. And, and I, and I hope that uh, other jurisdictions take, take note from that as well. So I, I talked a little bit about performance. Um, and so we've had a great, a great year, um, a couple of anecdotal views. So, so of course, you know, I don't know what your take is, but I, I get the feeling like we've seen higher quality sort of be the, the place that people have been navigating and, and gravitating towards. So Bitcoin, Ethereum have been sort of two of the areas that um, get a lot of attention. Of course, Bitcoin with, with some of the impending product launches in the US, but, you know, Solana and stuff have also seen pretty big years. Um, you know, second thing is uh, we've also seen um, uh, sort of a change in call it institutionalization. So of course, in the past, we saw some players come and go and this and that, but this year, um, we've we've got BlackRock, we've got Fidelity, we've got Franklin Temple, we've got a number of players who actually are making pretty big commitments to the space. So I'd, get, I'd love to get your take on how do you see, you know, the performance sort of playing out and are you seeing it broadly um, sort of within the institutional, within the retail space and, and what's sort of the anecdotal perspective that you have from it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really important. You touched on this earlier that there is a cycle to Bitcoin. At least there has been historically, um, and there's bull runs. It gets overexcited, and then there's there's uh, a correction into a crypto winner. And we've seen that cycle happen a couple of times historically, but each time the the highs are an order of magnitude higher the lows end up uh, settling where the previous high was. Um, and so the what it feels like is we're headed into a, a super cycle. There's a lot of catalysts on the horizon, obviously the Bitcoin ETFs, the Bitcoin halving, and the, the it, you know, it's really easy to lose perspective on the price. The last bull run, uh, the high is ended in, in the 60s. And I remember people t talking to folks who were saying in the 20s, am I missing out? Am I too late? And now we're in the, you know, hopefully the end of the crypto winter and we're settling in, in the 40s, which would have been a dream come true not that long ago as yeah. like the new high. And so I believe, and I think many people share the settlement sentiment, is that the, the highs of the next cycle will easily break through 100k and beyond and Cameron and I wrote a thought piece um a few years ago making the case for bitcoin one bitcoin being worth 500k and the way we backed into that is just looking at the market cap of gold and the amount of supply in bitcoin and doing that simple arithmetic to say okay if bitcoin's gold 2.0 then each one bitcoin has the small bull case is 500k bitcoin's obviously more than gold, so it could be a lot more. So um, I'm very optimistic in in that thesis, and I think we're going to get closer to it uh, this cycle. If not, maybe we could hit it. I mean, I I think all bets are sort of off. But why the cat? Why this is different is that the ETFs feel like they're going to happen. It's a when, not an if. Yeah, and that unlocks a huge amount of capital, and so. Uh, a lot of folks can't come to Gemini and open an account necessarily. Well, everyone's welcome, but um, a lot of folks have their net worth in a retirement savings plan like a 401k, and they can't really buy Bitcoin like the the asset directly. And so they need to buy a security wrapper like an ETF product. And I came across a stat recently, but something like, you know, half of half of the U.S. at least net worth 
their net worth is negative. The other half that's positive, 40% of that is positive. It's held in 401ks. Yeah. And so a Bitcoin ETF being green light unlocks all of that capital, that deluge of capital that can flood into Bitcoin that previously was gated from, from getting in there. And so it, it may be um, smaller checks in one way, but the aggregate is massive. And that other 10% of positive net worth individuals is probably maybe already in or has been in. Um, but there's a huge amount of capital sitting on the sidelines. And so that's why everyone's so bullish because um, like this is really an access problem. Yeah. I think most people believe in Bitcoin, the gold 2.0 thesis, and we can talk more about Ethereum and what our, my thesis at least is for yeah. that. Um, but that is a huge catalyst. When you see Larry Fink on, you can put two clips side by side a couple of years ago, yeah. Bitcoin's bad, it's fraudsters, whatever. It sort of sounds a little bit, a lot like Jamie Dimon still sounds today. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to not that long ago, it's it's uh, Larry Fink is now Bitcoin's biggest public champion. That's right. And so well, it, to see that change is 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 fascinating. Yeah, and I think it's actually really important because I go back to my comment at the outset to everybody like it's important to to do your own call it a thesis. And what you have is a lot of people out there who will make these statements, lavish statements. And one is they may have a bias. In the case of JP Morgan, they're the largest currency platform in the world. So Chase is the largest trading platform for currencies. They they have a bias to why crypto or Bitcoin is actually maybe a negative thing for them because they're high agency platforms. Um, but the second thing is like, you know, it's really important that you do your own re research because what I actually find really impressive and amazing is these individuals who may have been negative, you know, five, seven years ago, and then did the time and effort to go and learn on their own. And it actually changes. And why that's relevant is because, yeah, Larry Fink now is positive on, on why crypto is important. But second is, is that now you're going to have a organization like BlackRock and, you know, soon to be 15 players all talking about the relevance of crypto in portfolios and how they work or don't work within the context of an overall institutional or retail investment portfolio. And so that's going to be really, really important. I think the other part is you still have people out there who, for some reason, continue to believe that crypto is worth zero. And, you know, this is the thing that you talked about earlier about, like, as we go through these different cycles, one of the things that really kind of informs you about an asset is as you go through a very negative cycle, does it go down? Where does it go down to? And what you've seen is these foundational prices where you have a floor that um, actually is important. And so both in the crypto, sorry, in the um, in the period of the uh, uh, COVID crisis in, in sort of 2020, March 2020, and in 2022, Bitcoin fell to very uh, specific price levels. And those levels are really critical foundational levels. And as you talked about, they built from there. And that goes to, I think, the comment around what's actually happening in the ecosystem beyond sentiment. You see more and more people buying assets and opening up wallets. You have see more and more assets being tokenized in the, in, the, in the networks and the platforms. You see more and more use cases. And these are the things that are really important is that beyond sentiment, the actual infrastructure of the technology itself is also becoming more relevant. And that's the part that I think people forget. And so anybody who goes out there and says that Bitcoin will go to zero, I think is actually that that was maybe five, seven years ago. That's not something that you'll see going forward. I don't know what your perspective of that is, but you still see those comments out there. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because you do see people change their tune completely yeah. when they do the work and they dive deep, like Larry Fink is a great example. You almost never see people going the other way. Yeah. who have done the work, who have dived deep, understand what Bitcoin is, and then say, you know what? I give up on this. It's going to zero. Yeah. And I think that's that's uh, super powerful. But um, yeah, price is one indicator, like you mentioned. And when you look at the protocol and the folks working on it, the, the, the code commits, the upgrades, how it has been evolving, um, you can even look at the businesses um, in the space like Gemini, we're we're building every day and we have been for 18 months and we have a greater technology stack. We have a greater offering than we 
uh, did two years ago by a long shot. I think you can say the same thing for Coinbase. Um, but are we, you know, if we went out to the market and raised capital right now, would we be at our all time high? No. And I, and I think that price is, is sort of one indicator, but it misses what's happening underneath the surface. And a lot of amazing develops are happening. I can speak for obviously Gemini um, and in the industry. And a lot of people, like a lot of folks who are fair weather left, but the, the, the important thing is to build your thesis, obviously do your work, build your conviction, but understand that many of the gains that have happened in this space happen over a very small amount of time. It's like a couple of days or it's like maybe a couple of weeks total. And if you miss those days, you missed the entire decade of the game. Yeah. And so build your thesis, um, decide if you're in or out, but then like, you know, have the conviction to stay there because there, there's, there's a meme because there's a lot of tourists who came to the space. There's a meme of, you know, it's probably, you've seen it on, on the web crypto Twitter. It's like, you know, uh, I was really into crypto. Now I'm really into AI. <laughs> and it's like, you know, um, you, you can't just be bouncing around to the newest trend. You got to do the work, build the conviction. And, and when you do, I think um, you become more enamored with the technology, with Bitcoin. It is the first money that is purpose built for the Internet. It is money that works like your email. Um, and when you start comparing that to fiat and gold and other forms of money, you see how broken the financial system is for most people, despite what Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan say, well, it works for them. But most people in the world, the billions of people across the globe are not them, are not in their positions, don't have that access. They can't, they can't roll up to a JP Morgan branch and get an account, but they do have a smartphone that's internet connected. And that means that they actually have a bank account in their, in their, in their, uh, in, in their hand, in their pocket, and Bitcoin is their digital gold. So there's so much to talk about philosophically of why I think this, this technology is the future. Money is a technology. It's been evolving for 10,000 years, and this is the latest iteration, and it's going to keep happening. And so, um, you know, we've been in this for, for 10 years. We've been through this cycle at least a couple of times, and it, at this point, it, it just doesn't phase us at all. Um, we're going into the happening this time with Bitcoin ETFs, this time with inflation, which which makes the case for Bitcoin even more. Um, the Fed looks like they might be easing on rates. Maybe they'll even consider cutting so, uh, at some point next year. So there's a lot of catalysts. And all I can say is that um, don't write this off. I met so many people early on who who found Bitcoin before myself and Cameron. We found it pretty early in, 20, in 2012. And we started buying in the single digits, uh, you know, uh, uh, per Bitcoin. But I met I met friends who who found it earlier, and they just sort of they 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 blew it off, yeah. and 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 so they were there, but they they blew it off. They didn't do the work, and so they missed it. And then they kept saying, "Oh no, like I missed it. I missed it." And it's like, well, you missed it a thousand, no, missed it at five thousand, missed it at ten thousand, missed it at twenty, missed it at forty, and people are going to say the same thing at this point. But like, you know. Do the math on how many Bitcoin there are ever going to be, 21 million. There's there's 40 million millionaires in the world. So not every millionaire can even own one Bitcoin. And so the simple supply and demand, and you look at the market cap of gold, is that a, a single Bitcoin in our lifetime and not that long, I believe, will be worth easily a couple hundred grand, maybe a million dollars. Um and and again, like Bitcoin's a, a a platform. It's not just digital gold. It's a protocol. And so, um, as you can tell, we're highly optimistic, um, and we're, we have high conviction in the space. But but it's played out quite well. We haven't been proven wrong yet since 2012. So let's let's turn um, let's turn to kind of the news that's kind of driving the the markets a little bit in the last uh, couple of months which is the SEC uh, finally approving or likely to approve US ETFs. 
And, you know, look, this is a, this is an important moment. Uh, just uh, for everyone's perspective, you know, the, the, the space was already seeing lots of movement off of its lows into 2023. And then of course you started to see in the last couple of months, um, you know, after the grayscale um, call it court win or court case with the SEC, um, a expectation or an understanding that the U.S. market was going to open up. And I think, Tyler, you talked a little bit about what it means in terms of accessing massive amounts of capital, just the the frictions that it takes right now for an individual in the U.S. to buy, you know, um, crypto, uh, and then, you know, opening that up to all the sort of pockets of, of, of just simple broker dealer accounts and all the other things like that. But let's talk a little bit about this sort of horse race that's going to happen here. And I, I, I want just for everyone's purposes, I think you guys filed the very first filing for a Bitcoin ETF. What was it, a decade ago? Was that or thereabouts? Yeah, it was in um, July. I want to say July 2nd or 3rd of 2013. So and by the way, that would have been a pretty a price of Bitcoin at that point would have been what, about $500 or so? Oh, I think it might have been less, quite less, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, you know, what like that would have been a. I mean, now the infrastructure wasn't there for an ETF, and that's a really important point. But I just wanted to. I know that must be right. uh, sour to some degree for you, but but you know, you've gone off, of course, and built something well, important. Well, you know, the, 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 infrastructure. the biggest the biggest um, tragedy I think about, and maybe 2013 was too early, but we we ultimately got a denial in 2017, which I don't think was too early. Yeah. And it would be interesting to run the history again if. The SEC had approved that ETF or our ETF or any other ETF at that time. I don't think you would have had FTX. No, I don't think you would have had the amount of fraud. And so by not approving, they created this entire mess. And hopefully they'll finally get it right in 2023. But that that is um that's the regret or or the disappointment. Um, you know, Gemini, we decided that it's, you know, at like we, we wanted it to be infrastructure play and we're building out that piece of it. And so instead of being the ETF sponsor asset manager, um, our core competency is being the custodian and the service provider for those folks. So we're very happy with that position and we haven't re-entered that race and have, you know, don't have never seen ever, but uh, I think we yeah. probably you don't have a, you don't have a horse that race. Boat at this yeah. point. So there isn't a regret that, Oh, we, we, we could have been the, you know, won this race in that way because we're a part of it um as a provider we're on um a couple of i think at least three and maybe you know soon to be more um uh applications of many of the u.s providers and i think a lot of them are looking at a at a dual custodian model and which so is what looks... we do in which is what we do in canada which we're yeah. very very happy with right because you know we feel it's really important to have in this space it's not like a normal asset that has you know, you have clearance platforms and things like that. If you make an error or if more importantly, if somebody comes and hacks it, it's, it's, there's always risk. And so you have to have, you know, the structure behind it that that is very important. And so actually multi-custodian is actually a good thing. Uh, and we have a great relationship with you and Coinbase on that basis. Yeah. And I was just going to say that the two providers um, that are on most of these applications in, in most of these products in Canada and the US are ourselves and Coinbase. So it's very much a Pepsi Coke world. Um, and we're, we're very thrilled to play that role. And we've, we've been doing that effectively um, for, for quite some time in a, in a couple of years in, in with yourselves and Canada and others. Um, so, so yeah, um, going back to the original question, it's a shame that the, these approval didn't happen earlier in 2017 um, because I think it would have prevented a lot of the issues that we, and the pain um, that everybody felt in the last couple of years, but it does feel like we're finally here. And why everyone's so excited in one way is that I think January 11th is in that time period is is the last point at which the SEC can delay statutorily. And so they have to give a go, no go answer. I suppose if they disapprove there, they could delay in a way through a little bit of an appeals process, but like I think they're running out of time there. And ultimately, um, the courts and I think DC spoke on the grayscale case. The SEC didn't appeal it. If they were really trying to fight this and, and and hold off ETFs, they probably would have. So if you look at all of the signs and read the tea leaves, and and the fact that uh, Chairman Gensler doesn't say that 
you know, Bitcoin is is um, a security. They've been very clear that the one thing the SEC has been clear on is that Bitcoin um, is not a security. It seems like all signs point to an approval at some point in Q1 next year, which, as we mentioned earlier, will be a huge catalyst of sorts because it just it will allow folks to get in through different vehicles. And many people, um, whether it's a large pension fund or it's it's a retirement savings plan for an individual, uh, they need a securitized wrapping of Bitcoin. They can't hold a bar of gold. They need to hold gold through an ETF. They can't hold a digital bar of Bitcoin. They need to hold a security wrapper of it. And so this is this is really um, opening up the floodgates to that. And that that can't be underestimated. And it's the first time that traditional finance is really converging with this new world of decentralized finance. We've all been trying. We've, we've had the conversations. I'm sure Coinbase has as well with with all of the traditional uh, finance brokers and banks and whatnot, but it's been so hard to integrate and actually um, get us all together. And I think that this will be the first time where the old world of finance and money actually meets this new frontier. Well, and I would just add, um, so I think that's a really important point. And I think well, I would also add that um, most of the assets in the United States are, and, and globally are, are advised assets. So what it is, you know, most of the users of crypto today have been individuals, um, who have gone through their own setup of their own wallets or their own uh, accounts uh, at a broker exchange, um, but but you know the advised industry, the advised industry actually has for the most part not utilized um, crypto in their portfolios, mainly because utilization tools like ETFs hadn't been available in the United States and Canada. Of course, we've seen that, and I think that this will allow for the advised industry to now start to really look at a thesis of how crypto could be a part of their portfolios and. And frankly, that will happen um, because one, clients are asking for it. Um, the number of, of high net worth individuals who have crypto on the side of their accounts um, because they can't get it through their broker, traditional broker dealer account is really uh, you know quite quite high. And I think you're going to see that wanting to come into the main core part of a portfolio construction. I think the other thing is, you know, look, I I don't know if we're going to see this euphoric, exciting, you know, massive sort of demand in the first couple of weeks and months post-launch. Um, but I do think that to your point, we're now going to have, you know, theoretically 13 new issuers walking around talking about how crypto belongs or works within the contract of a portfolio, both for retail and institutional, both advised and unadvised. And you're going to see this become a foundational platform, going back to the earlier thing we talked about, which is, you know, the sentiment is one thing, but the foundations of utilization are growing. And so that's the thing that really drives that sort of next stage of this cycle um, as one component. I don't know where you like, I'd love to get your perspective of also coming into sort of through 2023 and into 2024. What's the sort of institutional market um, advisor market kind of change that you've seen in sentiment? And, you know, what are, what's sort of the anecdotal perspective that you're getting within your business, which actually would open up direct custody accounts and stuff for many of these organizations? Yeah, well, the sentiment is very positive and, and folks are very excited. Um, we've seen just anecdotally a lot of institutional clients come back. Um, they took a break from crypto, um, you know, during the whole turmoil with FTX and, and the crypto winter. And so they've they've come back. Um, so there's a lot of new excitement. But I think your point is really interesting is is about the the investment advisor platforms it's it's i think there's an analogy here where if you're a hedge fund manager of some certain caliber that you get on the platform so to speak of asset allocators it's like getting on the the shelves in walmart if you have a some sort of consumer packaged good and and there's like the positioning on the end caps of of, of shelves or right near the register right. um for a decade, Bitcoin like can't get on the shelves. It can't get on the platform. It's not near the register. Um, when you walk into Walmart, you just you can't buy it. And so all of a sudden, when these ETFs go live, like what does that mean? 
it's like a hedge fund manager being on the platform and then CalPERS can literally allocate to them. Or, you know, all of these folks who use these investment advisor platforms for BlackRock, they they say, you know, they 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 toggle a switch and they say, okay, what's your risk appetite? Or how do you want to uh, allocate your capital? And Bitcoin's there. It's a choice or it's under the hood and you didn't even know it, but you've allocated to it based on um, your, your, return, your, your, your goals. Yeah. And so I think that that is the way to look at it. And that is the excitement. It does feel like we are back. Yeah. And, and it's not just the Bitcoin we are back. It feels like the crypto market is back. The spring is around the corner. We talk about crypto winter, but you know we say winter is a season, and this too shall pass. Yeah. It feels like spring is around the corner, and then all of a sudden, after spring, there's summer. So that is the way I'm looking at it. There's tremendous excitement on Wall Street. Um, there's tremendous excitement in um, market makers. They're coming back, and there's a preparation, and there's an anticipation for these ETFs getting greenlit. And we're seeing people come back and trade again, test the pipes and just get ready, get their ducks in a row, get really familiar with the platform um, so they can create redeem baskets um, and obviously um, uh, manage their positions and and, and whatnot on on the exchange. So um, if we were having this conversation six months ago, that would not have been... The case, yeah. I'd say, we're still in the you know the 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 um, the depth of crypto winter. Not much has changed since um, you know twelve or eighteen months ago when things started to to blow up. Um, and uh, but now it feels like a lot of this is behind us. People are looking ahead, and they're really excited with the catalysts of um, you know as we've mentioned with the ETFs um, and obviously the halving. And and I think that the, the halvings for, for people who don't know, it just means that- Let's the, talk about that actually. Let's go through the halving and just for everyone's purposes, maybe just walk through like what's actually happening in April or thereabouts and why it's relevant, you know, for Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the, the amount of Bitcoin is fixed. And I always love to dwell on this point because gold is scarce, it's not fixed. And so if the price of gold goes up, Mining becomes profitable. People find more gold. Um, as technology improves, people can find more gold as well. It's sort of like fracking unlocked more energy and oil um, and whatnot. And so the, the but you can never unlock more than 21 million Bitcoin. Um, but the supply schedule is such that every four years, that amount uh, halves. So it's still going to end up at the same spot of there's only 21 million Bitcoin ever released. Um, but the 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 amount that's being uh, minted every 10 minutes or so will cut in half. And people, there's always this, there's been this age old argument of, of um, well, that's priced in with the market. It's always, it's always priced in and people know it's coming and therefore it won't have much price action. But historically speaking, it's always been a big catalyst. It's never been fully priced in. I don't know exactly why if the market's not um, efficient enough, but um, if, if, uh, if there's only, let's say 25 Bitcoin being minted every 10 minutes, the miners will be minting or will, will unlock that will go down to 12 and a half. And, and, and the miners are the ones who are unlocking this. This is a reward they win for auditing the blockchain and making sure that, uh, you know, I don't spend my Bitcoin twice. You know, they create the digital scarcity and that's the reward. Um, but when they do that, when they unlock the reward every 10 minutes, they usually sell that to get capital to then buy more mining rigs because it's a it's an arms race and the technology is always improving. And so they're always plowing back some of their rewards into their mining infrastructure to, to win the next award. And so all of a sudden the sell pressure on the Bitcoin marketplace 
is going to reduce by half. Miners will just have less coin. They'll win less coin and be selling less coin. And that usually always, it's again, it's just basic supply and demand that usually creates some upward price action. It certainly doesn't depress the price because there's just less sell pressure. But the other thing, it's kind of an X factor that always happens is that there seems to be like adjacent um, new aspects that that new concepts that are that 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 become a become a thing um, and sort of a Cambrian explosion of experimentation and, and innovation. And so DeFi started happening around the, the last uh, happening. Um, you had NFTs. Um, before that, in 2017, 2018, there was ICOs, the ICO craze, the idea of you can build a token, a token on top of Ethereum, and that created a lot of bull runs. So there's a lot of, there's like a, there's a Cambrian explosion of innovation and excitement that always seems to happen right around or just after the Bitcoin happening, which you could yeah. say is maybe not related, but it's at least deeply adjacent to and it seems to keep happening um and so of course there is the happening is a catalyst for bitcoin but it seems to be a catalyst for the entire industry yeah. well i think that's extremely important so for everyone's benefit i mean this is going to have a disinflationary effect it's it happens every four years this is going to be um uh, a year that it's going to occur in the sort of first half of the uh, 2024 but more importantly it's also going to it's it's generally very positive for price um, uh, it's foundational price movement. And so you sort of couple that with ETF and what's happening around the ecosystem. It's really exciting. You know, you mentioned Tyler earlier, you know, you have a thesis on ether. I'd love to, let's, let's spend some time on ether. We've we talked a lot about Bitcoin and I think for most of the people online, it's really important first to start with like Bitcoin and ether, they get talked about all the time together. Um, they move a lot in price movement together but they are very, very different in terms of what's the driving force for their long-term thesis. Um, Bitcoin has, you know, this call it fixed supply, supply and demand, you know, the gold-like principles. And when you start thinking about the principle of, of economic growth, the the, the um, uh, sorry, the um, uh, global population growth, and and where they are going to transact in in such, what probability would you apply to Bitcoin becoming one of the most uh, interesting non-jurisdictional currencies in the world? with a fixed uh, supply. But I, when you look at Ethereum, which is non-fixed supply and has a foundational utility and infrastructure around what you're building on DeFi and other types of uh, principal stable coins and such on top, I'd love to get your perspective on why you like Ethereum uh, differently or why you are excited about Ethereum versus Bitcoin as you go into the year ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Ethereum is definitely not as fixed as Bitcoin. Nothing is, um, but its its supply story isn't it is pretty is pretty scarce, um, yeah. and and that's probably beyond the scope of this conversation. But um, you know, the way to analogize Bitcoin, and we've talked about this before, is digital gold or gold 2.0, and you can think of Ether as digital oil. And so, if you think about all of the cloud computing. So Amazon, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Google Cloud, if there was a token that allowed you to purchase compute so you could run your applications on top of those cloud providers, uh, that would be that token would be Ether. And so Ethereum is a, a virtual cloud machine, if you will. It's like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google combined. And it's where you run your decentralized application on it. But unlike Amazon, you can't put your credit card in and open an account and pay them for their computational resources or storage. Um, the Ethereum cloud computer, if you will, requires Ether. So it's a very valuable, it's the substrate, it's the fuel, it's the oil of this, of the largest virtual computer in in the world. And that's what excites me. It's very different. Um, you know, Bitcoin's very much the gold story, the, the fixed supply, the hard sound money. But Ether, the Ethereum network is where people will create decentralized Twitter, decentralized Uber, decentralized Facebook. 
And ether is is the 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 oil, the fuel that will make that happen. Well, and and you know, I'd add to that is that like, you know, one of the nice things that um uh, ether's done as well is as you talked about the from a supply perspective. Um, they move to um, uh, proof of stake as a as a form of mining, right? And so what that means is that the the the, the if you own ether, you are ultimately able to become the mining, the, the 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 validators of the transaction in the platform, and you participate in the value of the ecosystem's growth. So revenue growth, you get a piece of that. And as the platform grows, and and you are an owner and a staker, you ultimately are generating a share of the uh, overall profit. It's a very very unique kind of environment. And when you think about this principle of like a well-governed, well-structured um, platform, and then you've got this year coming in, um, you've got some upgrades in terms of the Cancun fork, which will actually um, drive prices of transactions down below uh, a penny per transaction, which will, I think, in many ways, drive Ethereum to call it a more mainstream uses while platform and layer two type of technologies are growing, stablecoin utilization is expanding massively, all of this really exciting stuff that will increase the value of, I think, the network itself. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I get so excited about it. I think just even just a very simple one is I'd love to get your take on stablecoin um, utilization and, and what you're seeing on call it these layer two, call it stablecoin platforms and how you sort of see that evolving over the next decade in a number of years. Yeah, and and just just the final point is that you know owning ether is a really simple way to index the entire Ethereum network. So it's like owning land in Manhattan hundreds of years ago. All of the skyscrapers, all of that incredible uh, activity that will be built on top of it, you become the beneficiary. So instead of picking which which building or, or which entrepreneur or which real estate developer. Just by owning the substrate and the land of Manhattan, you you benefit by the entire ecosystem that's being built on top of it. So, you know, Ether is the native L1, but um, all these L2s, all these other projects as, you know, the entire stack will just own the the easy way to get in is just to own the, the index, the underlying native fuel that everything requires in the Ethereum um, ecosystem. So um, stablecoins are really, really interesting, really fascinating because they are basically taking, um, you know, old world fiat money and and giving it a, a cryptographic form factor so that it actually works like your email. Um, it's sort of like a wrapper. It's like, how do I get government fiat money onto the blockchain? So you know, I would make the case that you don't want to spend your Bitcoin. You don't want to sell your Amazon stock because these are great assets that, that appreciate. You want to spend your money that's depreciating your government fiat money. Um, and so, oh, no, that's not on the blockchain. So how do I, you know, transact and and, and use a medium of exchange? Stablecoins provide that linkage. They bring fiat onto the blockchain so that it works 24-7, 365, it's truly global, it goes everywhere the internet will go. Um, and so really important, but there's also a lot of projects that are algorithmic stable coins that aren't a wrapping of the fiat form factor. We have um, the Gemini dollar at, at Gemini, but the dollars are held in bank accounts and the token is issued. Um, so it's kind of... Uh, mixing, you know, the new frontier of, of DeFi and, and traditional finance. But um, they've been super important um, for folks who want to, you know, move money around, but also not really, really store their value in, you know, lifelong appreciated access like, like Bitcoin and Ether, but maybe, okay, now I need to trade, I need to buy something. Then you you transfer some of that into to a stable coin, but you leave the majority of of your assets, just like in traditional finance, you don't really touch your your gold holdings, you don't touch your 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 stocks that you think are going to go up, and you keep some some cash on the sidelines, and that's what stable coins are. The blockchain. Yeah, and, and and you know I couldn't agree more, and I think it you know you think about the next layer of how this will, the expansion of utilization, it's just, you've seen this amazing explosion of utilization of stable coins. And I think, um, I think you're going to see that grow. And it's one, one of the things I'm really excited about. Maybe just before we get off and, and we're at an hour here, I just wanted to maybe ask you one last question. You've had a 
long-term thesis in the space. You, you know, you've talked about being, you know, really excited about crypto, Bitcoin for over 11 years, 12 years now. When you think about what energizes you about the next, you know, sort of next 10 years, what is the, what's one of the most exciting things you're interested in right now that's driving the next stage of your thesis? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think the most exciting point is that so much of the promise that we know is going to happen hasn't happened. Um, it's still really early. Um, the most of the world is is not on a blockchain. You know, most of finance is in traditional finance. Um, most of applications are still run on Web 2.0 and owned by a few companies. Um, Web 3 hasn't really arrived. We see glimpses of it, but a decentralized internet, decentralized finance, decentralized money, that future is still not, I mean, it's here in glimpses, right? If you're if you're intrepid enough to go on the frontier, but it doesn't underpin our daily life. Um, there was, uh, you know, conversations like, will we really transact on the internet? Will people really buy their plane tickets on the internet? That'll never happen. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait, how do I live without Amazon Prime and and all these um, services and applications? So it is um, it it is still uh, so early, and that's what excites me. There's so much unfinished business that needs to be finished and accomplished over the next decade. And so, if you think you're late to the game, it's just beginning. Um, Obviously, um, another convergence that's really interesting and that's that's very, very relevant is AI. Yeah. AI has has definitely arrived on some level. Um, and and the the we've been talking about this for for a while is that, you know, the the AI can't get a bank account with JP Morgan. It's just not going to. Right. But it can plug into a protocol like like Bitcoin. And so crypto is really money for AI and machines. And it's going to be fascinating to see that convergence over the next uh, decade as well. So it feels like everything, all of the pieces are coming into place. The stage is being set. And I'm really excited to finally accomplish, you know, what we talked about and dreamed about for the first decade over the next decade and and then some, um, really the the promise of crypto, um, the 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 financial inclusion aspect, the you know really really changing uh, and evolving uh, money, Wall Street and finance as we know it. That is what keeps me going. Is I just don't feel like we're done, yeah. And I feel like there's decades of unfinished business ahead of us. I think that's well said. And I would just add that like, what's amazing is that through 2023, you're starting to see real um, efforts and, and execution on the legitimization of payments and crypto as a core payments utility. You've seen really important elements around um, platform of uh, TradFi to, to DeFi and, and the principles of, of all of the foundational uh, alignment. And then as you say, when you start thinking about nativity of what crypto is, in a digital society and digital society being whether that be you know commerce on in, in digital nature or ai it becomes so aligned to that future state it gets exciting and the and the last thing i i'd say what what really just continues to drive me is that when i think about sort of global population and growth you know you think about you know we have 8 billion people going to 12 but about you know 3 of those um 4 billion that we're going to grow from are going to come from africa another billion is going to come from southeast asia um you know non china Th those those not not nothing in developed economies like europe and us and canada those regions you know, are going to non-jurisdictional FX. They're not going to be in the traditional uh, fiat models. And who, what probably, sure, the US dollar, sure, the euro, whatever, you know, you want to put on those probabilities of being dominant currencies. But what probability will you put onto a non-jurisdictional FX currency like Bitcoin and or stable coins that will be built in the future? And you have to put that sort of leading probability in those right now. There may be, they may not win 100%, but there's a high probability that they do have a shot to win and it's probably the leading opportunity to win. So I get excited about that. 
And, um, and so, you know, we have to really look at this as an exciting space to be a part of. I, I believe that every individual should have some allocation, especially when you're in a high net worth family, should have some allocation to this, this, this space and, and, and Bitcoin and Ether being the two that are most relevant. Um, Tyler, this has been awesome. Thank you very much for taking the time with us. And um, we had a number of questions online. I think the team was basically answering them um, on uh, the Q&A chat. And uh, we ask if you have anyone has any further questions, please reach out to us at Purpose. We're happy to answer them. And we're excited about uh, the next uh, couple of months. We're excited about the next couple of years ahead. And, and thank you very much. And great, great partnership to be with Gemini uh, and what you guys have been doing with us for the last number of years. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate the conversation. Cheers. Happy New Happy holidays, everybody, and happy new year to everyone. Thank you. Likewise.